October 2002. Hundreds of young tourists enjoy a tropical island resort. Then, massive explosions rip through the packed nightclubs. The bombings claim 202 lives. It's the worst act of terror since 9-11. Now, using advanced computer simulation, we reveal exactly what happened in the Bali bombings. Behind every disaster lies a chain of critical events that decides who lives and who dies. Unravel the fateful moments in those final seconds from disaster. Southeast Asia, Indonesia, the island of Bali. Bali's tropical breezes blow in vacationers from all over the world. The warm Balinese welcome is legendary. It's the number one holiday destination for Australians, reached by a three-hour hop across the Indian Ocean from their west coast. October 12, 2002. Another perfect day dawns in this tropical paradise. October is one of Bali's busiest months, and most tourists head for its biggest resort, Kuta Beach. Three generations of the Kemp family arrived from Perth, Australia. 31-year-old Tracy Ball saved all year for this break, and she's delighted to have her younger sister, Melinda, along. Tracy's daughter, five-year-old Brianna, brims with excitement. It's her first overseas trip. And Grandma and Grandpa Kemp will be close by in the apartment next door. The family deserves this special vacation. Four years ago, Tracy's husband, Peter, a police officer, was killed on duty. The tragedy left Tracy a little anxious about being away from home. It was always in the back of my mind that you just always have to be careful no matter what you do, wherever you go. And especially going to a different country, you don't know exactly, you know, what's going to happen. Indonesia has the world's largest Muslim population, with 210 million followers. But on the island of Bali, Hindus outnumber Muslims by almost 20 to 1. The two faiths have lived in harmony for centuries. Abdul Aziz, alias Samudra, performs his ritual cleansing for the first call to prayer. He's a devout Muslim, but his motives are far from the non-violent teachings of the Islamic faith. He's a homegrown Indonesian terrorist, in Bali to command a group of fanatics intent on causing death and destruction. 12 o'clock, midday. Perth, Australia. 20 young men from a local football team head out to Bali. This is footage of their trip. 25-year-old Ben Clohesi and his teammates are looking forward to two weeks of sun, sea, and socializing. 100 different libidos, um, basically all pumped, ready to go. As Ben and his friends arrive at Bali's international airport, at a rented house 11 kilometers away, terrorist mastermind Samudra calls a strategy meeting. The five men present are part of an Islamic terrorist network extending across Southeast Asia. It's called Jema Islamiya, or JI. And hundreds of its members have been trained by Al-Qaeda. In 2001, Al-Qaeda moved several of its training camps from Afghanistan to secret locations across Indonesia. Their Academy of Terror produced a new generation of Indonesian recruits. They've been linked to a series of bombings and attacks in the region, killing dozens of people. Seven thirty p.m. Saturday night and sisters Tracy and Melinda are looking forward to an evening of fun. Their parents volunteer to look after Brianna.
When Tracy's husband died, Melinda immediately moved in with her to help raise the little girl. The sisters are inseparable. We did become best friends, which was awesome. She became very much someone that I depended on nearly every day. As little Brianna sleeps, Samudra's terrorists prepare their deadly weapons. Tonight, they'll bring Al-Qaeda's global jihad to Western tourists in Bali. They plan a symbolic explosion outside the US consulate, northeast of Kuta Beach. But their main bombing targets are two popular night spots, Paddy's Bar and the Sari Club on Legian Street. They load a white Mitsubishi van with one ton of explosives. 9.30 p.m. As the sun goes down, Kuta Beach lights up with neon as the club scene comes to life. At the heart of the action is the resort's buzzing central strip, Leggy Ann Street. It's where sisters Melinda and Tracy are heading for their girls' night out. But it's the terrorists' destination too. Three of them drive the explosive-packed van south towards Kuta Beach. Melinda and Tracy arrive at one of Leggy Ann Street's most popular hotspots, the Sari Club. It's already hopping. Nearly 350 young men and women, mostly Australians, cram inside. 10.52 p.m. The terrorists leave the northern suburbs and enter Kuta Beach Resort. They have to drive slowly. The van is weighed down with its deadly cargo. The Australian footballers roll up at the Sari Club. 25-year-old Ben Clohesi is ready for his first taste of Bali's nightlife. They park themselves at the bar and start drinking. 11.01 p.m. The terrorist white van reaches Leggy Ann Street. The three men each have an assigned task. One of the men jumps on the back of a motorbike. His mission, to detonate the bomb outside the US consulate. Inside the Sari Club, Tracy and Melinda have had a great night. But Tracy is anxious to get back to daughter Brianna. I kept saying, we, we really need to get going. Because I had said oh, we wouldn't be out too late. Now, the explosive-packed van stops right outside the Sari Club. A second terrorist jumps out and heads for his target, Paddy's Bar. He makes his way inside through the crowd of Western tourists. Across the road in the Sari Club, Melinda persuades Tracy to stay for one more song. Outside, the van is creating a traffic jam along the one-way street. But the driver isn't going anywhere. Then, suddenly, a terrifying explosion rips through Legian Street. Inside the Sari Club, nobody is hurt. Some people even think the noise is some sort of celebration. I just thought it was a bit of fireworks. How happy we all were and excited that we were. You know, you never thought anything bad could happen. But sisters Tracy and Melinda are in an open air part of the club. They can see a column of smoke rising from Paddy's bar across the street. Dozens of people spill out of the club onto Leggy Ann Street to see what's going on. It brings them even closer to the explosive filled van still parked in the street outside. People partying in the Sari Club in Bali's Kuta Beach Resort hear a huge bang outside. Many of them flock onto Leggy Ann Street to see what's happened.
it brings them within meters of the terrorists' explosive-packed white Mitsubishi van. 15 seconds after the first blast. A second colossal explosion rips through Legian Street. It kills dozens outside and inside the Sari Club instantly. Within seconds, a raging inferno traps hundreds. Flames also engulf victims trapped in vehicles caught in the traffic jam. Home video footage captures the chaos as frantic bystanders run to escape. Exploding fuel tanks add to the panic. Inside the club, the party atmosphere is transformed into a scene of carnage and devastation. Survivors desperately search for a way out of the flames and choking smoke. Thirty-one-year-old widowed mother, Tracy Ball, is buried under a stack of rubble. She feels people walking over her as they rush to escape the inferno. Desperately, Tracy digs herself out of the debris. But there's no sign of her younger sister, Melinda. She was nowhere to be seen, and there was just fire and screaming from all directions. So at the same time, I'm screaming, I have to find you, I can't find you. Melinda! Footballer Ben Clohessy finds he can't move. Heavy timber beams and debris pin him to the ground. Flames race through the thatched roof above. He thinks it's about to collapse on top of him. Ben drags himself out from under the rubble and starts to search for his teammates amidst the carnage. The first thing that was going through my head is I've got to find the boys. I was looking around, trying to find any sign of life. Ben can't find them. But instead of trying to escape the blaze, he starts to help other people. Outside, it looks like a war zone. Fierce fires spread through Leggy Ann Street. Buildings are ablaze over an area 120 meters wide. Burned and maimed survivors lurch out of the devastated buildings. Many local people rush to help survivors. One of the first on the scene is Kuta Beach traffic chief, Agus Bambang. I saw dozens of victims exiting and running outside of the club, away from the engulfing flames. Some were shouting, saying, it's so hot, it's so hot. Please, help us get to a hospital quickly. Bambang orchestrates rescue efforts to help the victims. Among those killed and injured in the blast, dozens of his fellow Balinese. There were not only foreign tourists, but also local people from Denpasar, who came to Kuta for the weekend. Inside the Sari Club, footballer Ben Clohesi is also helping the injured. He leads two survivors to the only area of the blazing club that looks free of flames. But he finds that a four and a half meter high wall blocks their path. He summons all his strength and starts to heave people to safety. Amazing what a human body can do in time of need. While survivors head for the only part of the club not in flames, 31 year old widowed mother Tracy is still desperately searching for her missing sister Melinda. As flames rain down from the burning roof, Tracy thinks of her five year old daughter Brianna and realizes she must make a terrible choice. Does she continue to search for her sister and best friend Melinda, or 
escape while she still can. What if I get out and she's here waiting for me to find her and she burns to death? How do I tell mum and dad that I left her behind? But then I thought, what will mum and dad tell Brianna when I don't come back? She makes her decision. Tracy heads for the club's south side. A wall has been shattered by the blast, but it's still two meters high. Thinking fast, she finds a beam to use as a makeshift ladder and clambers to the top of the two meter high wall. She escapes the blaze just as it engulfs the area behind her. Tracy makes it as far as the curb outside the club. All around her, rescuers struggle to help people amid the chaos. Then, emerging out of the mayhem of Leggy Ann Street, Tracy's father appears. He heard the blast from the apartment and raced to the club to look for his daughters. My dad came in that instant and found me and said, Tracy, oh my God, where's Melinda? Her father's unexpected appearance gives Tracy new hope. Perhaps he can find Melinda. But many people are still inside the burning sari club. One of them is footballer Ben Clohesi. He's heaved countless people up the north wall to waiting hands and safety. Ben doesn't know whether all his teammates made it out. But the heat is now unbearable. He has to go. But there's no one left to help him. He must get over the four and a half metre high wall on his own. Because the fire was coming that quickly, you know that if you miss it, that, you, you know, you're gone. It's Ben's only hope. He summons all his strength and jumps. Somehow, Ben reaches the top and scrambles over. Thirty-one-year-old widowed mother, Tracy, waits for her father to return with word of sister Melinda. After five minutes, her dad comes back but it's bad news. I wasn't prepared for him to not come back with her. I was expecting him to come back, you know, have you know her hand in his hand and saying, here's Tracy, see, everything's okay. 1 a.m., nearly two hours since the blast. The disaster overwhelms the emergency services. Over 300 injured survivors must make their way to local hospitals and clinics any way they can. In cars, vans, even on the back of motorcycles. Tracy ends up in a tiny local hospital. She suffered third degree burns, mostly to her back. She's alive, but needs urgent surgery. Despite staying in the blazing club to help people, Ben Clohesi escapes with only minor burns. Hundreds of people are missing. Among them, Tracy's 25-year-old sister, Melinda. Her distraught father, Ron Kemp, scours every clinic and hospital in Cooter Beach. But he's losing hope. By 3 a.m., ambulances arrive with the last of the survivors. But he still has no news of his daughter, Melinda. Many of those listed as missing are now confirmed dead. The search takes him to a small private hospital. 
There, he finds Melinda. She's alive. The blast knocked her out, and she has no idea how she escaped the club. Miraculously, she only has minor injuries. 5 a.m. As Tracy is wheeled out of surgery, the sisters are finally reunited. They looks over to me and she's just in tears. She's like, oh my God, you're okay, kind of thing, you know. It's, it's not really words said, just looks. Even now, it makes me cry because I just, I could then relax and realize that everything was gonna be okay. The next day, Tracy's five-year-old daughter, Brianna, insists on visiting her mother and aunt in hospital. She was so brave and, and you know, crying, but at the same time saying, Mummy, I love you, and even though you're burnt, I still think you're beautiful, and that was the first thing she said to me. Over the next three days, Indonesian rescuers continue to pull bodies from the rubble. The death count eventually reaches 202. Victims come from 22 different countries, but Australia is hit hardest of all with 88 dead. Three days later, Ben Clohesi and his surviving teammates return to Perth, Australia. Of the 20 young men who flew out, only 13 are going home alive. The remains of the other seven will be returned to their families. News of the disaster shocks the world. Mysterious, deadly bombings tonight in Indonesia. At least 50 people have been killed tonight, many of them tourists. The largest number of foreigners killed and injured in the Bali attacks were Australian. It's been just 13 months since 9-11. Many suspect that this is the work of Al-Qaeda. But why is the peaceful island of Bali a target? Investigators must sift through the debris to discover who are the killers that brought hell to this heaven on earth. Now, by rewinding the events of that fateful day and by going deep into the investigation, we can reveal what really happened that night in Bali. Advanced computer simulation will take us where no camera can go, into the heart of the disaster zone. A new day reveals the extent of the devastation. The damage zone stretches across 28 hectares. The Indonesian National Police appoints General E. Maid Pastika as its chief investigator. But Pastika knows that he has neither the manpower nor the forensic experience to investigate a disaster on this scale. We understand and realize now that our technology is very far left behind. Pastika turns to the Australian Federal Police, or AFP, in Canberra for help. The force puts forward AFP veteran Graham Ashton as joint investigator. Within 24 hours, Ashton and his team of 140 experts head for Bali. Senior forensic chemist David Royds flies out with the team. Also on board the plane are several people desperate for news of their loved ones. You know, you're full of anticipation, you're nervous, you're excited, and you're with a team, and you really feel fired up. And suddenly you realise that at the front of the plane there's two or three other people, and they're actually relatives going over to search for their children. It was a really emotional experience, so. As the Indonesian and Australian teams swing into action, they have no clues as to who caused the explosions. But detectives based at Bali's police HQ soon get their first lead. A report from the US consulate, 11 kilometers northeast of Legian Street. 
The consul claims he heard firecrackers going off less than a minute after the Lady Anne Street blast. But what the forensic team find in front of the building tells a more sinister story. A wrecked stretch of curb and the remains of a mobile phone. Both test positive for the high explosive TNT. The evidence suggests a small device remotely detonated by phone. Western consulates and embassies are a favored target of terrorists. Investigators believe that this has all the hallmarks of a deliberate terrorist attack. Its aim, not to kill, but to tell the world that the explosions in Bali's nightclubs are a new front in the terror war against the West. Eyewitness reports reveal that as well as the US consulate bomb, there were two explosions in Leggy Ann Street. A smaller one inside a night spot called Paddy's Bar, and one outside the Sari Club. The investigation team start to comb the 28 hectare blast zone for evidence that might lead to the killers. It's a monumental task. Even the tiniest piece of debris might provide the crucial lead. It could take months. And after just two weeks, there's a major setback. Local officials are in a tough spot. They're under pressure from Kuta Beach's predominantly Hindu residents to clear the blast site. These local Hindus believe that the ghosts of blast victims haunt the area. They want to hold a ceremony to purify the site and release the troubled spirits of the dead. But it means scooping up all the rubble and casting it into the sea. The officials tell the Australian and Indonesian investigators their time is up. The bulldozers are wanting to, to clean the street up. And um, so if you want to get any more samples, you've got, you know, two hours. Clearing the blast zone will destroy crucial evidence. If the investigators can't stop the bulldozers, the murderers of 202 innocent holidaymakers and Balinese might never be caught. Behind the scenes, Indonesian and Australian investigators alike negotiate for more time. They argue that Bali's biggest industry, tourism, is at stake. Catching the people is as important as clearing this crime scene because if we don't catch them, tourists won't come back. After a day of argument, they finally strike a deal. The investigators get just two more weeks to scour the site for clues. After that, the bulldozers will be back. It's an enormous task. The 28 hectare blast zone is strewn with tons of debris. Now the team have just 14 days to complete a task that would normally take months. Meanwhile, detectives interview hundreds of eyewitnesses. Many claim they saw a white Mitsubishi van parked outside the Sari Club just before the explosion. It drew attention because it caused a huge traffic jam along the one-way Legian Street. There's now a 60 centimetre deep crater where the van once stood. And it's at the epicentre of the blast zone. It's clear to investigators that a bomb inside the van destroyed the Sari Club. But who owned the van? To find out, investigators need to locate the remains of the van itself. It won't be easy. The van would have been blown to bits in the blast. And the explosions destroyed 19 vehicles and 32 motorbikes on Leggy Ann Street. Forensic experts must examine thousands of twisted remains piece by piece. Then, after four days of searching, a team member makes a remarkable discovery. Across the street from the Sari Club is a two-story bank. On its roof, 
he finds a piece of chassis one and a half meters long. By analyzing the impact damage, the experts can work out how far it was from the explosion. The tests prove the piece of chassis is from the white van. The scientists scour every centimeter of it and find something stamped into the metal. It could be the van's registration number, a crucial lead to its owner. But it's completely illegible. The terrorists file down the number so that it couldn't be traced. The team's first big find ends in disappointment. We were thinking what would have been a great head start if uh, they'd been stupid enough to leave the engine numbers on the, on the, on the chassis block. So uh, we thought, oh well, they're not that stupid then. Oh well, back to the hard slog again. But the joint Indonesian and Australian team refuse to give up. They try a different tag. If they can discover what the bomb was made of, they may be able to trace people who bought large quantities of the relevant chemicals. They focus on the chemical fingerprints at the crime scene. But there's a problem. The explosions severed water mains so that any chemical residue was washed away down gutters and drains. Then firemen doused the area with high pressure hoses. Investigators can't find any trace of suspicious chemicals. Then one of the team has a bright idea. Where else can we look creatively to try and find these samples? So uh, one of the guys really cleverly just looked up. The blast could have blown chemicals hundreds of meters from the scene, leaving traces way above ground level. It may be their only hope of a lead on the bomb's makeup. The team races to swab the leaves of trees, signposts, even telephone lines within 60 meters of the explosion. The forensic team painstakingly tests hundreds of samples. We were analysing as much as we could, as fast as we could, and we were getting negative results, negative results, negative results. The heat is on. In just 14 days, the bulldozers will clear the site into the ocean. The team tests over 2,000 samples. Then, finally, their persistence pays off. A leaf from a tree inside the zone supplies a crucial clue. It tests positive for potassium chlorate. It's a commercially available chemical found in industrial cleaning material. And it's a classic ingredient of a typical homemade terrorist bomb. The team now knows what caused the blast that demolished the Sari Club. The terrorists detonated a bomb made of homemade explosive packed into the rear of a Mitsubishi L300 van. It's a promising lead. Detectives on the team start to track the purchase and delivery paths of large quantities of potassium chlorate. The hunt is on. Time is running out. At the blast zone, the forensic team need more evidence before the bulldozers return. And they've only scratched the surface. They must still find out what happened inside Paddy's bar where 20 people died. Eyewitnesses report a separate, smaller explosion here, seconds before the Sari Club blast. The forensic team works day and night to search through the mountain of debris in the ruined club. Then chief forensic scientist David Royds spots something. My eyes fell upon this little bit of copper wire that was no more than five centimetres long. Just jumped out at me like that was like pure gold. Royds suspects that it could be part of a bomb planted by terrorists inside Paddy's bar. He runs tests on it and finds traces of the high explosive, TNT. He concludes that it is a piece of bomb detonating wire. To find the epicenter of the blast, Royds devises an ingenious experiment. Tracing back from the explosion's impact points, he creates a spider web of string. 
Where the strings intersect reveals the exact place where the bomb went off. It's one meter off the ground. It raises a disturbing possibility. So at this stage, we started to think that this could well be a suicide bomber. On the ceiling, directly above the blast epicenter, Royds finds a cluster of human tissue. He takes a batch of samples and conducts DNA tests. The DNA all belongs to one person. The team also finds fragments of fabric radiating out around the epicenter. They're an exact match for fibers found on the detonating wire. It's a huge breakthrough for the forensic team. They now know exactly what killed 20 innocent people inside Paddy's bar. 11.07 p.m. A suicide bomber walks into Paddy's bar wearing a vest lined with TNT. When he reaches the packed dance floor, he hits the detonator. It's the first suicide bombing in Southeast Asia since the Vietnam War. Investigators now know exactly what caused the three explosions on the night of October the 12th. But they're no closer to catching the bombers. Detectives have been unable to trace any bulk purchases of potassium chlorate. And there are no further leads on who owned the bomb van. The hunt for the bombers stalls. With the terrorists still at large, people across Southeast Asia must face the prospect of further attacks. But Chief Indonesian Investigator General Ime Pastika refuses to admit defeat. Six days before the investigator's deadline, Pastika orders his team to re-examine the 1.5-meter section of chassis from the exploded van. The terrorists covered their tracks by filing down the vehicle's registration number. But he hopes that perhaps some other clue was missed. Then Pastika, a devout Hindu, goes to a temple to pray for a breakthrough. During his devotions, he gets a call. Yeah. It's one of his deputies. Yeah, he imagine him sitting there praying and his cell phone goes off. Yeah. General, uh, where are you? Are you not in the office? And he said, no, I'm praying for the success of the investigation. And he said, oh, you must be uh, hitting the right note then, General, because I've just found a number on the chassis rail. When the team re-examined the piece of chassis recovered from the bomb van, they found a piece of metal four centimeters long welded onto it. When they remove it, they discover the vehicle identification number. The terrorists picked the wrong country to buy their bomb vehicle. They filed off the two usual identifying numbers, but obviously didn't realize that commercial vehicles in Indonesia have a third number stamped on the chassis. One of the van's previous owners welded a support strut to the chassis that covered it up. The terrorists didn't even know it was there. It's an astonishing breakthrough. Investigators search through vehicle records. They quickly track down all seven previous owners of the van, including the last person to buy it. His name is Amrozi. He's already known to authorities as a member of Jamaa Islamia, a terrorist network linked to Al-Qaeda. Amrozi is still at the address on the island of Java where the van is registered. On November 5th, 2002, Indonesian police arrest him. Amrozi confesses and reveals what he felt when he first learned of the deaths and devastation the bombs inflicted. 
I was very happy. How can I describe it? It was like when I was still a bachelor trying for a girl and you finally get to meet her. It was that sort of excitement. But this was even better. Within weeks, police arrest several of Amrozi's accomplices. Among them, Samudra, the mastermind behind the plot. The men confess to the cold-blooded murder of 202 innocent people. The arrests are a triumph for the joint investigation. But disturbing questions need to be answered. Did Western intelligence agencies know that a major attack by Anrozi's group was imminent? And did governments warn tourists in Bali that they were a target for terrorist attack? A joint Australian and Indonesian investigation leads to the arrest of several of the Bali bombers. 34 Jamal Islamia terrorists are tried and found guilty. Three are sentenced to death. The rest receive prison sentences. Their confessions allow the investigation team to put together the missing pieces of the puzzle. It reveals what really happened on the night of the Bali bombings. Why terror came to paradise and left holidaymakers and local people seconds from disaster. December 2001. A J.I. plot to bomb the U.S. Embassy in Singapore is foiled by police. A month later, the group changes its strategy of targeting Western embassies. Now its followers will attack soft targets, bars and clubs frequented by Western tourists. Eight months on, in Bali, chief plotter Samudra scouts for targets on Legian Street. He chooses two of the most crowded tourist hangouts, the Sari Club and Paddy's Bar. October 6th, six days to disaster. In the rented house in Den Pasar, the J.I. terrorists start making the Sari Club bomb. They pack the suicide bomber vest with one kilogram of TNT and make the device intended for the U.S. consulate. Two hours to disaster. The terrorists have loaded the Mitsubishi van. It now contains one ton of potassium chloride mixture, packed into 12 filing cabinets connected by detonating cord. Three minutes to disaster. 30 meters from the Sari Club, Ali Imran gets out of the van. One minute to disaster. The first suicide bomber, a young Indonesian known as Ferry, walks into Paddy's bar. When he reaches the packed dance floor, he hits the detonator. Just 15 seconds later, a second suicide bomber, 24-year-old Arneson, hits the switch on the van bomb. Forty seconds later, the terrorists use a phone to detonate the device planted some three hours earlier outside the U.S. consulate. It announces to the world that the Bali bombings are an attack on America and its allies. Australian tourists, Melinda and Tracy, were lucky to survive. But back home in Perth, they wonder how the unconscious Melinda escaped the blazing Sari Club. I thought, well, my fingernails are in perfect condition. I don't have any burns or lacerations or anything to my feet. I wondered, how did I get out? The question spreads through Perth, Australia. Who saved the girl in the pink dress? Word reaches 25-year-old footballer Ben Clohesi. 
He recalls helping an unconscious blonde girl over the wall and realizes it was Melinda. He visits Melinda to tell her the story. Meeting Ben was just like meeting, you know, a saint. He had saved my life, you know, and it's, it's so hard to describe, you know. How do you feel when you meet someone that saved your life? Many others owe their lives to the brave actions of traffic chief Agus Bambang. As a Muslim, he cannot understand how the terrorists could claim to act in the name of Islam. Several Western governments, including Australia, admit to receiving intelligence before the bombings that J.I. was planning to attack Westerners in Southeast Asia. The U.S. and Australia issued warnings to its tourists to be cautious when traveling around the world. But Australians who lost loved ones want to know why they weren't warned of the specific danger of travel to Indonesia. An Australian Senate inquiry finds that the government should have warned its travellers that they might now be actively targeted. Thirty days after the bombings, investigators keep their promise to hand over the crime scene to the Hindu community. The ocean waves receive the spirits of the dead. The investigation of the Bali bombings accelerated intelligence gathering on Jamaa Islamiyah by an estimated three years. The US, Japan and Australia now work together to help Southeast Asian countries monitor and combat the continuing threat of terror in the region. <laughs>